Hello, I want to talk today about bundle adjustment and explain you the key ideas of this gold standard method that we use in photogrammetry as well as in computer vision in order to perform 3D reconstructions of the environment from camera data. So given that you have images taken from a camera and you want to turn these images into a 3D model of what you are picturing, then this lecture here is for you. It's um, a first part on bundle adjustment. There will be a second lecture coming soon looking into the numerics of bundle adjustment. So which kind of numerical tricks can we use now to solve uh, the bundle adjustment problem in an efficient manner. Um, but that's something that we're going to investigate um, next time. Today we'll look into bundle adjustment itself and what are key problems that I have if I want to do my 3D reconstruction and how I can actually tackle this problem. So 3D reconstruction is um, a relevant task in a lot of applications and we want to today look into the question how we can do this from image data so that we don't have a range sensor such as a laser range finder but only work on camera images and a large set of camera images and perform the 3D reconstruction. In the lecture so far we looked into camera pairs so how can we estimate 3D information of the scene giving a camera pair and today we want to extend it to an unlimited number of images. So if you have n larger than two images, how we can we perform 3D reconstruction of the scene? And this is a, still a very um, relevant task and um, something that we use very often as standard tools for measuring tasks. So what you see here, for example, is a UAV um, that can fly through the environment, take camera images with its camera here, and then build 3D models of the scene. In this example, it's a UAV flying over a field, and the resulting estimate could look like this. So you can see here with those blue planes, this should be the image planes, the different locations where the system has been, and what you see down here are triangulated feature points. So for example, SIFT features that have been extracted from the camera images. We perform a triangulation and estimate the locations of those 3D points in the environment. And this would be the output of a bundle adjustment system. We can use this output and pr uh, process it further in order to solve other tasks. For example, generating orthophotos. An orthophoto is a special type of image that we'll also uh, investigate here within our photogrammetry lectures, um, which is basically an image where you can measure in, in, in this XY plane. So a distance in whatever, tw 20 pixels over here corresponds to the same distance as 20 pixels over there. And you can see the overlay of the orthophoto here from that field and the locations where the um, UAV had been flying. And then we can, of course, turn this also in a digital elevation model so that you can see here the height information that is extracted from this field. So there are plots here um, where you see different heights and this is the information that you can extract from this camera data. This is just kind of one classical example using this for mapping from the air, from a UAV, from an airplane, or in the old days from a balloon. Um, but of course, you can also move your camera freely through the environment and perform the 3D reconstruction task not being constrained to um, an aerial vehicle, for example. So we may ask ourselves, why do we want to do multi-view re reconstruction? So why are two images not enough? And this can have several reasons why two images are not sufficient. One of the um, explanations could be that the object has simply a too complex surface so that two images are not sufficient to um, picture the whole surface of my object. Or the resolution that a single image or two images can have is not sufficient to fulfill the uh, constraints on the precision um, that uh, I may have. And then I may need multiple images in order to get an accurate reconstruction of the environment. Um, we may also want to estimate the motion of the sensor through the environment. For example, if you want to estimate the location of the UAV or want to track the position of a car or a robot through the environment. And in this case, we are of course interested in a sequence of images which have been taken from a camera installed on the car in order to do this 3D reconstruction task. So we can on the one hand side estimate the um, location of our sensor in the environment and on the other hand we can estimate a model um, of the environment itself. And I brought you here a small example. This stems from Luc van Gogh's lab at KU Leuven and uh, a spin-off company G Automation which performs mapping tasks using um, image technology. So what you basically see here is a van moving through the environment and on these van are several cameras installed and these cameras 
um, picture the environment, the surrounding of the car. So you can see here there are eight camera images being taken, um, always pairs of two in a stereo setup, so two looking to the front, one looking to the left, uh, one pair looking to the right, and one pair looking um, backwards. And then by moving through the environment, um, you can perceive the environment at different locations um, and record those images, extract features out of those images, um, estimate the location of your vehicle with respect to those features, relative orientation plays an important role here, and then we can kind of put those things together into, in the end, a very large least squares problem that we want to solve. And this is the solution of the bundle adjustment um, problem. So in the end, we can perform mapping here at city scale, and obtain 3D point cloud information um, about all those streets where the vehicle has been driving just based on the camera data. And you can overlay this with maps, you can also use it of course to generate maps and it's a standard mapping technique in order to build models of the environment and estimate the vehicle within that map. Of course if we have that map we can also kind of go into the 3D point cloud that is generated and perform um, simulations of what we would see, where points would be mapped to on a virtual camera that is driving through the environment. So I can do this of course with the location of my actual camera, um, but I can also do this with a virtual camera so that I can realize those fly-throughs through the mapped space and estimate what a camera would see if it would be at a certain location. These are all tasks that I can do with the result um, that is the output of such a bundle adjustment system. So um, bundle adjustment or originally called bundle block adjustment is the technique of estimating the orientation of my camera, which is a six degree of freedom um, parameterization, parameter um, for every camera, and the three locations of points in the environment. And I'm doing this on block, so I'm taking a larger set of images into account simultaneously in order to perform this estimation. So today this term block is typically dropped in modern literature, so today we just call this bundle adjustment. And bundle adjustment is a technique which is around since approximately the 1950s, developed in the photogrammetry community, and it is frequently used or was traditionally used for building maps, um, aerial, or building maps through aerial vehicles. So by flying over the environment, triangulating certain points in the environment, um, I was able to estimate where was the vehicle and where are the points in the environment. What we typically also use are so-called control points, which are those points um, indicated here by those triangles. These are supposed to be points where we know the 3D locations um, in the scene already, and then we can actually use this to kind of anchor the model or the photogrammetric model that we are building here with our bundle adjustment system and anchor it in the real world. And I can also use this to fix certain um, points at certain coordinates. So aerial triangulation is a common task um, and one of the kind of standard tools that you can do when you want to build a map of the environment, you want to perform measurements, for example, using a UAV and um, collecting your image data. And what all the kind of out of the box software that you may be using in order to um, perform your model estimation does is basically performing bundle adjustment. So, there's, it is kind of the standard solution. There are, of course, different flavors. You can exploit different assumptions. Um, if your UAV, for example, has a GPS on board, then it's a wise choice to use this um, GPS information for your 3D reconstructions. Um, and therefore, you may have different bundle adjustment systems which can exploit different properties. Um, but overall, this is an automated process today and really a standard tool that is frequently used. And again, this was the example that I've shown in the beginning of the, it's kind of the real world image of this old illustration originated by Ackermann. Um, this is how that looks like today in reality. So the main question that we need to answer is kind of how does bundle adjustment work? What is behind it? How does it work? How do I turn my image into a 3D representation of the world? And as before, we are assuming in all our three reconstruction tasks that we can estimate features from our image data. This can be SIFT features, this can be SURF features, this can be binary features, whatever it is, but we assume that we are able to extract distinct points in our images. And then we are only using these points in order to perform our 3D reconstruction task. That means for all the features that I extract from my image, I want to estimate the three location of the object that generated this feature response in my image in 
the real world. And I'm doing this using a nonlinear least squares approach for estimating the camera poses as well as the location of the 3D points in the environment and doing this simultaneously at the same point in time. And kind of the overall idea is explained rather quickly. So as with all these squares approaches or nonlinearly squares approaches, we assume to have some initial guess. Um, we will talk about later in this lecture how we may obtain this initial guess. And then we take the initial guess in terms of three locations of points in the environment and six degree of freedom camera um, orientations and project those 3D points into our virtual camera images. So we say, assume the camera locations and the 3D point locations are correct or would be correct. Where would the 3D point being mapped to, to which pixel in my image plane? And then I'm performing this mapping virtually and get a pixel coordinate for this point in a certain camera image. And then I basically compare this projection in the 2D image plane with the actual measurement of that point that I obtained. So by checking in my real camera images, where has this point actually been mapped to, to which pixel location, and comparing this to the pixel location where I mapped it to in my virtual camera, I can see if there's a discrepancy. If there's no discrepancy, everything looks good. So that means um, the point and the camera configuration are consistent with this observation. But often this is not the case. So often there will be discrepancy. And this is the error that I'm trying to minimize. So I'm trying to find configurations for my camera orientation as well as for the 3D points in the world to minimize this so-called reprojection error. So I'm projecting the 3D points back into the camera image and compute my error in the camera image, basically in an offset in X and Y pixel location. And I'm trying to optimize, so change my camera position and change the location of my 3D points in the world in order to minimize this error. So that in the end, hopefully the error is close to zero everywhere. And um, this is the overall approach. I, of course, need to iterate this process. So I get an update in my unknown parameters and I reproject them back and perform this, uh, these last three steps over and over again because it's a nonlinear squares approach. We need to linearize in here. And as a result of this, we need to iterate that. Okay, and what I now want to do is I want to look a little bit further into this reprojection error, into the projection of the points from the 3D world into the image plane and the discrepancy of what we think where the points should end up and where they end up in reality. So at this point in time, I assume you know how to map a point from the 3D world into a camera image with our standard equation, um, small x, or so the um, location in pixel coordinate equals px, where p is the projection matrix and x is the 3D point in the world. And we will come up actually with the equation which is shown over here, which is the basic equation uh, for my least squares approach for my um, Gauss-Markov model. So what I have here on that side is the pixel location of the point I projected into camera J. So I is my point ID and J is my uh, image ID. So point I projected into camera image J. So this is the pixel coordinate in some arbitrary frame that we have in here. And then these are my corrections, the V, um, X, I, J. So this is basically the correction. So then the discrepancy um, between where the uh, point is mapped to according my coordinates and um, where I'm actually seeing this. So this is part is where I'm actually seeing this point. This is my correction. And that should be equal to this equation here on uh, that side. So what we see here, if we start here from the right hand side, we can see that this is the 3D location of the point in the environment where I assume this point to be. So it's initially this would be my initial guess of the point I in the world. And then I'm projecting this point XI through my projection matrix of my camera. And this will give me in homogeneous coordinates, therefore I have a scaling factor over here, the point in my image plane. So what I here have on that side is the three location of the point expressed in homogeneous coordinates. My projection matrix P, which projects a 3D point in the world into my image plane. And you can see this, there are a couple of parameters here involved in this projection matrix. So this is my projection matrix with my potentially nonlinear calibration parameters. 
um, and my scale factor over here. Um, and remember this, in an, an homogeneous object is only defined up to a scale factor. So we have this scale factor over here if we look into a minimization problem. And um, we, this, this um, projection matrix here has a couple of parameters. Um, these are my uh, projection parameters as we, we typically know them from our direct linear transform. If this is the affine camera as our model. And then in addition to this, we have um, nonlinear distortion parameters or other parameters um, as well as the pixel location where the point is mapped to originally in my pixel before the nonlinear corrections so that I can take the appropriate action and um, take also the nonlinear errors into account. So what we basically have in here in this P are all the intrinsic parameters of my camera, my typical, typically five intrinsics plus potentially a number of unknown parameters. And I also have uncertainties associated to this. So these are the uncertainties in the image coordinates. So how precisely can I actually measure a feature point? So if I have SIFT features and I may be able to see, I uh, say I can nail down a SIFT feature up to, let's say, a third of a pixel, then this would be the uncertainty that I would actually generate. And we can have individual uncertainties for the individual image points recorded in the individual images and also take um, correlations into account if we have that information available. Okay, so what is this reprojection um, doing? It projects a point from the 3D world into my camera image. And so what this equation encodes is the projection equation from my camera, so all the intrinsic parameters of my camera and the extrinsic, so where is the camera and how does the internal mapping process looks like. Um, the error is basically the distance or the discrepancy between where I see the point in reality, the real observation, and where I think this point will be mapped to, and this is exactly the discrepancy. So the, the amount by which I would need to correct the observation in order to bring this to an equality. And this equation encodes a collinearity constraint, um, and this is basically given through this index i over here. That means if I see this a point in uh, the one 3D point in the world from multiple camera images, let's say from image one and two, let's say this is point i, which I see in camera image one and two, so I would have i1 and i2 over here. By knowing this is the same index j, I make sure that the exact same point in the world is actually projected into my camera images. So the assumption here is that the two projection rays from the two camera images actually intersect at that point xi. And this point xi can be uniquely determined because I know for every point in the world where this point is mapped to in a camera image. And that's also something that we refer to as known data association. So we can, for every feature that I extract in my image, I can uniquely identify this feature point. So I will find exactly the same feature point in all other images. That is in reality a very strong assumption and um, a lot of efforts that bundle adjustment systems do in terms of computational effort goes into finding the right data association you know, to make that correct and avoid mistakes in this data association because mistakes in this data association will have a bad impact on my state estimation problem and I'm not likely to come up with a correct solution if I don't take the fact into account that I have outliers in my data association. So that's something that you have to take care of in reality that you get your data associations correct. Okay, so the question now, what are my unknown parameters? How, so how many unknown parameters actually do sit in this equation that I want to estimate? Um, so first of all, what we have, we have our 3D point in the environment and this point has a three-dimensional coordinate. So x, y is that coordinate in, um, in my world. So I need three unknowns, or three unknown parameters for every point that I see in the world. I have my scale factor sitting over here and this is just uh, a one-dimensional, a real number. And this is just the factor um, that comes from the fact that I'm working in a homogeneous space over here. Um, so where everything is only defined up to a scale factor. Then my, I have my exterior camera orientation, so where is the camera in the world? This is a six degree of freedom vector encoding the X, Y, Z location of the projection center of my camera, as well as uh, the direction where the camera is looking to with three rotational angles, your pitch roll, for example. And then I have five parameters for the kind of standard intrinsics 
in my projection matrix. Um, these are kind of the linear parameters, uh, the fine camera model that I'm using, and a certain number of unknown parameters, Q, which are potential uh, parameters describing an un, uh, nonlinear error, for example, a barrel distortion. Um, for barrel distortion, I would have one or two parameters that I need to put in here in order to describe them, and these are the additional parameters that are involved in here. So those parameters are typically independent from the images that I'm taking, so um, I'm, assume, I'm typically assuming that my uh, camera, uh, so the camera parameters, the intrinsics don't change if I'm at a different position. Um, if this is the case, we may also take that into account. For example, if you have an airplane flying and your camera uh, is exposed to strong temperature changes, then certain parameters of your projection matrix may change. So during flight, when the camera cools down because you're high up in the air, um, certain parameters may change and potentially you need to take that into account as well. Um, for now, we often assume, however, that those calibration parameters are actually constant during the data acquisition process. Um, this, of course, needs also to be taken into account in an extreme case if you just take um, a set of images and you have no idea from which camera those images have been taken. In this case, um, of course, we have the effect that every image can have completely different calibration parameters. And these are kind of extreme cases of the bundle adjustment system um, where we don't use one measurement camera, but maybe collections of images taken from the internet and want to build a 3D reconstruction of the scene, which is then more advanced because it has every image can be, um, or it will be generated using a different camera and such, such a different camera calibration matrix. So we can take our equation here and actually break it up into two parts. Um, so one is the calibration matrix over here, which includes all the um, interior parameters or the interior orientation of the intrinsics and our exterior orientation, also called extrinsics, which is my rotation matrix and the location of my projection center in the environment. Okay, just to kind of illustrate the unknowns that we have in there, just make, let's make a small example. So let's have a look to the example. We say we have 10,000 images and maybe we see 1,000 feature points in every image. So we have rather high resolution images and extract 1,000 points per image. We have um, 10,000 images over here and let's assume we will see every point on average 10 times. So that means um, we have a substantially dense coverage of the environment with camera images. So basically, we have everything seen 10 times. So the question is, how many unknowns do we have right now? How many observations, uh, point observations do we have given our equation over here? And it turns out that the number is actually quite large. So what's the degree of freedom of my observations? So what I'm observing is an X and a Y coordinate for every point. So for every point in every image, I get two variables, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate in my pixel coordinate frame. So I have, I said I have um, 1,000 points per image, I have 10,000 images, every observation is two-dimensional, that means two times 10,000 times 1,000, which gives me 20 million observations. So I have, uh, the degree of freedom of my observation vector would be 20 million in this example over here. The next thing, let's have a look into the number of unknowns that I have. So um, if I have um, 10,000 images with 1,000 points each and um, every point is seen on average 10 times, that means I have 1 million points in the environment that I'm actually mapping. Every point is, has a three-dimensional vector attached to it, an x, y, that coordinate. That means I have 1 million points times 3 gives me 3 million parameters for the point coordinates. Then, however, I have a large number of unknowns in terms of the scale parameter because the scale parameter is given for every pair, so for every camera image and feature point, camera image and feature point, I get an own scale parameter. That means I have 10 million of those scale parameters. So the scale parameter is only the same for the X and Y location um, for one point, but every point will, be, will have an own scale parameter. That means 10 million unknown scale parameters are involved in here. Then I have camera orientations, I have 10,000 images, so I have 10,000 orientation parameters with six degrees of freedom if I'm now only considering the, um, 
the extrinsics and assume my camera has just one set of calibration parameters, so I may have whatever, six to 10 additional parameters for the intrinsics, which we can completely ignore over here in terms of their number. Um, so if I sum this up, I will end up having something around 13 million unknown parameters, so a 13 million dimensional vector of unknowns and a 20 million dimensional vector of observations. And what you can already see, those are really, really huge numbers. And we need to look that we can actually get those numbers down. If we look to this equation and the number of unknowns, there's actually one quantity in there which I'm actually not really interested in. So actually, I don't really care about that scale parameter. I mean, I know I need that scale parameter because I've expressed everything in homogeneous coordinates here as a homogeneous entity. And um, every homogeneous object is only defined up to a scale factor. So as long as I'm working in homogeneous coordinates, I need to take that scale factor into account. But in practice, I'm not interested in the scale factor. In the end, I want to have the x, y, z coordinates of my point in my Euclidean space and the uh, three locations for a camera three-dimensional location vector for the camera and the three-dimensional rotation parameters uh, vector for my camera and the rest I don't care about. So that's a point in time where we actually should move back from the homogeneous world into the Euclidean world. Um, although we, are, we like our homogeneous world because it allows us to express uh, things typically easier than in the Euclidean world, now is a point in time where it makes sense to move back. So we now should move back into the Euclidean world in order to get rid of those scale parameters because this will reduce me the number of unknowns that I have from 13 million to something like 3 million. So it's a big decrease in terms of the number of unknowns and that is something that I should do. So what happens if I'm turning this expression back into um, Euclidean coordinates? I basically um, perform this operation and need to divide by the last component and so I can actually rewrite this. So this vector, just by the change of fonts, turns from a three-dimensional vector, so two plus one dimension in my homogeneous world, into a two-dimensional Euclidean vector, a two-dimensional Euclidean offset vector, and then I have here this expression, which is the original um, uh, projection matrix, so kind of the uh, first row and the second row divided by the third row um, of the resulting vector that I have. So this is this notation, this is the first and the second row and this is the third row, which is basically the normalization that comes from the mapping from the homogeneous world into the Euclidean world. So if, you are, if this confuses you, I recommend you to go back to the um, lectures on homogeneous coordinates where we introduced homogeneous coordinates in here so that you understand um, how that mapping from the homogeneous world to the Euclidean world actually happens. And then I have reduced my unknowns from 30 million to approximately 3 million, which is a big gain, and that's kind of the step that I could do here on that abstract level. So in this example, I have 3 million unknowns, 20 million observations. This gives me still a very large system that I need to construct, um, but I'm kind of better off than with 13 million unknowns. And theoretically, from then, kind of my standard procedure starts of setting up my system of linear equations or my normal equation system um, in the least squares uh, sense. So with my unknowns x and my observations l, so here now using the standard notation from the least squares um, estimation community, um, where x are my unknowns and l are my observations. Um, so be aware the x we used before, so the x here is an observation and this x here is now my unknown, but I'm just using it here on the slide and wrote unknowns and observations underneath it to make sure you don't mix that up. But then we are setting up our standard um, system of linear equations. So we have um, our matrix A, our Jacobian, transposed my information matrix, my Jacobian times delta x. So the change in my parameters is the Jacobian transpose the information matrix times the um, delta in the observations. Where and by solving this system, I basically get an update to my unknown parameters. And in this way, can iteratively estimate my unknown parameters and solve my least squares problem. So from a kind of theoretical point of view, that's all good. We know what to do and can solve this problem. So that in the end, the bundle adjustment, um, solving the bundle adjustment problem is just solving a least squares problem. In practice, however, it's slightly more tricky. Um, the reason for that is, among other reasons, that this linear system gets huge very quickly. So for real world setups, this gets very, very large. And as a result of this, the typical out-of-the-box application of my um, dense 
system of linear equations which should be solved cannot be applied because it's um, too inefficient for other computers that we have in order to solve that. So therefore, we need to do a couple of tricks and exploit some of the properties that the bundle adjustment um, provides for us in order to um, avoid the, the, the fact that I can't solve my system of linear equations. That's something I'm going to cover in the next lecture, looking into the numerics of the bundle adjustment problem. So for now, we are ignoring this for today and assume we can solve this very, very large system and we don't care that in practice our memory is not large enough to store even all the quantities, all the quantities that we have. So we ignore this for today and say, okay, assuming we can solve this and we will find a way for solving this, discussing this in the next lecture, um, so we can solve it and in this way obtain our unknown parameters and this way get an estimate about where the cameras have been and where the 3D points are in the environment um, in order to perform all the estimation approaches involved in here. So how does it look like? This is an example um, of a couple of images taken here actually in our kitchen next door. So you can see here the loc estimated locations of the cameras, placing a few objects on a table and extracting feature points here of a table, a couch and a few objects on that desk um, in the environment. And then just by taking a couple of those images, registering those images with respect to each other, fixing the data cessation, doing the estimation, we can estimate the location of these points in the scene, a standard output of a bundle adjustment system, in this example created with the open source software Meshroom, um, which you can use where you can plug in your camera images and get a 3D reconstruction of the environment. The software can even do more, you can even do uh, an estimate of the surfaces so that you get a reconstruction which actually looks like this, so you can see the table over here, the two objects placed, and the couches over here, you can see that the, the um, the fabric of the, of the couches are, is not perfectly flat and smooth, so there's still some noise involved in there, also leading to, or resulting from the fact that the data station on um, the fabric here is probably very challenging because it's very hard to find distinct points. But over all in all, this gives you a really accurate reconstruction of the environment and turns this set of camera images actually into a nice 3D model. So you can try that on your own, take images with your smartphone or with your camera, and plug it into Meshroom and then give Meshroom a couple of hours time in terms of computational resources, uh, computational, um, or in terms of computations, and then you will actually generate, or it will generate for you uh, a model in, with 3D point locations as well as surfaces of the environment. And this is a typical result that you get out of that. So after we have done that, we wanna kind of inspect the result that we obtain a little bit further. So what are properties of the result? What are things that I need to take care of, especially considering that I'm taking a least squares approach, for example, with respect to the initial guess, with respect to outliers, or with respect to um, control points, so points with known location in the environment. What do I need to take care of in order to come up with an appropriate model of the environment? So the first few words about the um, properties of bundle adjustment. The, the great thing is that bundle adjustment is a statistically optimal solution under certain assumptions. Um, statistically optimal means there is, in a statistical sense, no better way for solving it. But, of course, there are some assumptions associated to this. Um, so the bundle adjustment approach, um, approach exploits all the observations that we have been taken and considers all the uncertainties and potential correlations that we actually have. At least if we can specify it, the system can actually take it into account and in this sense takes all the available information into account in order to come up with the estimation of our unknowns. That means it estimates the orientation parameters of my cameras, so exterior, exterior orientation and interior orientation, as well as the location of the three points in the environment at a high precision. The assumption that it does is um, everything is Gaussian, so we have Gaussian noise involved in here, um, and um, that can be seen as a very strong assumption, especially under the effect of the um, unknown data cessation. So the system assumed a known data cessation and the Gaussian noise on the data cessations, but what we have in practice is that we can nail down a large number of the data cessations correctly, but there's a risk that some of the data cessations are wrong or will be wrong. And if we assume purely Gaussian noise without any potential mistakes in the data association, we will not get a great model of the environment. And the second thing is, as all the um, least squares approaches or nonlinear least squares approaches, um, it requires us to have an initial guess about 
um, where the cameras are in the environment and where the three points are in the environment. And this initial guess actually matters here because if you have a very bad initial guess, the bundle adjustment is unlikely to converge. So we need to invest some brain power and maybe some additional sensors in order to get a good or reasonable initial guess and are then able to converge to the right solution. The first thing I want to look into is um, the now the absolute orientation through control points. So again, absolute orientation was the task of anchoring the model that we, are, that we have created in the real world and also fixing the scale. So fixing a similarity transform between the model that I've computed and the real world. That's something that I need to do. Why do I need to do this? Because the, um, the, the reconstruction from camera images um, without any additional information only gives us a so-called photogrammetric model. That means a model that is only defined up to a similarity transform. That, mean, that means we cannot say where that model has been taken with respect to an external reference frame. These are six degrees of freedom of the similarity transform, so a three-dimensional translation vector and a three-dimensional rotational component. But what it also cannot fix is actually the scale. So we do not know the absolute scale of the scene. We can say the distance in that scene is larger or smaller compared to a different distance in that scene, but we do not know its absolute scale. The reason for this is, similar to the relative orientation that we computed, uh, that cameras are basically direction measurement devices and which don't tell us anything about the absolute scale. Unless we have some additional information like uh, we know a certain size in the world of an object in the world or we know the translation that a camera has been taken, so if we have this additional information at hand, then we can fix the scale or have an additional sensor, but otherwise it's only defined up to a scale factor. So what we need to do is we need to um, fix the scale and the six degree of freedom rigid body transform, so that in some way we have a similarity transform between our photogrammetric model and kind of our real world. And um, this is something that we can solve with the absolute orientation problem, um, something that we have discussed. So if we know a certain number of points um, in the environment, in the simplest case, three or more points. So of points that we have seen in the world, we know they are 3D coordinate, then we can actually anchor that model using the absolute orientation approach that we have discussed um, previously in here. But we can also integrate that all into our bundle adjustment and just adding the control points to our least squares problem and solving it jointly without explicitly um, executing the absolute orientation. And that's something which is typically done, but it also directly raises another question. And this is actually how good do I actually know my control points? Are my control points really absolutely perfect points or do they also have an uncertainty associated with it? Because what typically happens is you have an additional measurement device with which you measure the, your control points um, and then you're observing them with a less accurate measurement device such as a camera. That means um, you have a more accurate sensor which allowed you to nail down the um, location of your control point but still there's typically some noise associated to that. So the key question is um, our control points, that means points for which we know their X, Y, Z location in the world, should I consider them as noisy or should I consider them as noise free? So what's the best thing? So how would an error actually look like um, if I want to take that into account in my least squares approach? I would say my estimated coordinate should be identical to the provided coordinate. So my kind of ground truth information plus some corrections because this information that was provided to me may not have been correct if there's noise associated to this. So this is probably a small um, vector of my corrections, but it may, it may be non-zero. So what's the right way for taking into account? Using it like this or saying the provided coordinate is actually the real coordinate and I can take the coordinate of the control points out of my minimization problem. That would be the alternative. So should I do it noisy or noise free? And we can answer this question um, under different um, objective functions. So we can say, are we interested in getting the statistically optimal solution taking into account all the points, including the control points? If this is the case, we should consider the control points as noisy because they are noisy in reality because they are not perfect. And we should take that noise information into account at least as soon as, or if we have it available. So taking it into account is needed for the statistically optimal approach. If I, however, would fix the control points, 
What it actually means is that I'm enforcing a geometry onto the bundle adjustment solution. So it means certain points will not be moved. They stay at the location where I fixed them through control points. And this can also be interesting. For example, if you want to build a model and align it with some official map data, for example, so a map that you, that you as a user are not able to crack, but you want to have your model being in line with that external, let's say, um, official map, for example, then you want to really fix your control points to, make, to enforce this geometry on your model that you're actually computing so that the resulting model that you get is in line with the official map data. This is then a statistically suboptimal approach. That means in a statistical sense, you don't get the optimal solution, but you enforce this additional constraint that you say these control point locations must be exactly these coordinates. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So it depends a little bit on, the, on where your data comes from and what you want to do with the resulting model if you want to enforce the geometry or you want to also correct potential mistakes in the control points. Um, you can also do both things kind of together. So you start with noisy control points, perform the statistically optimal solution, and then you perform a statistical test in order to search for gross errors or outliers in your control points, because maybe even there was a mistake in your control point, someone noted a wrong ID and you kind of mix up coordinates of those points. Something that shouldn't happen, but of course can happen. And what you can do is you can perform a statistical test and see the uncertainties that you um, assume for those control points are in line with the result that you get. And if this is not the case for some control points, you can actually elim eliminate those um, outliers in your control points, get rid of them, don't consider them, only fix the other control points and then run your bundle adjustment with your fixed control points if you want to be in line with, for example, some official map data. If you don't need to do this, you can save step two and don't have to do step two and you're done after step one and, um, and have your statistically optimal solution. So a few last words towards uh, for control points. So the question is how many control points do I actually need? So if I think to my previous solutions for computing geometry out of camera images, which was the direct linear transform or the projective three-point algorithm, we needed three to six control points pair image pair. So for every pair of images, I needed three, or four, um, up to six control points, depending if I was interested in the P3P or the DLT solution. So the question is, how many control points do I need to now, now need for the bundle adjustment problem? So if I would run the bundle adjustment, compute the bundle adjustment solution completely without um, my, um, without control point information, and then later on compute the absolute orientation. So assuming that only a similarity transform separates the resulting photogrammetric model from my map data, then um, uh, I only need three control points because we have seven degrees of freedom that need to be fixed. Every point has um, it's a three-dimensional vector, so we need to have at least three control points in order to fix this. Um, this is typically in, in bundle adjustment, you, you still want to have a few more than just three um, non-control points, but the number of control points that you need is much, much smaller than this three to six per image pair. Um, so what is typically done, that kind of the boundary of the area you're mapping, you're actually covering this with control point if you have that information at hand to kind of minimize the uncertainty of the 3D uh, point reconstruction inside your, your area that you're mapping with your bundle adjustment approach. Um, and the reason of not requiring so many control points is, besides the fact, of course, that you're a statistically optimal solution, is one of the key reasons for using bundle adjustment uh, because it's simply highly unpractical to have that many control points that you can guarantee that every pair of images sees three or even six control points. And therefore, you use go for bundle adjustment because you can so dramatically reduce the number of external control points. Um, again, you don't even need a control points if you're fine with obtaining a photogrammetric model itself without anything else. Okay, now we come to uh, two further very important things. Assumptions that the bundle adjustment system does and the question is how can we actually tackle those assumptions? How can we um, not make sure, but at least increase the probability that um, we are we can fill, fill those assumptions and this doesn't lead to a problem. And the first thing is the initial guess, my initial configuration. As all the nonlinearly squares approaches, um, we need also here an initial guess, so initial configuration of the three location of the points and our camera orientation. And the question is, how do I get that initial guess? If I'm very far away from the initial guess, 
the system is unlikely to converge to compute the right solution. And as a result of this, you won't get um, a consistent photogrammetric model out and you will not be able to uh, accurately determine the location of your scanner in the environment. Um, so for, our, for image pairs, we had direct methods to apply for estimating the relative orientation. For example, the eight-point algorithm or the five-point algorithms are techniques for coming up with a direct solution. Direct solution means we don't need an initial guess, so we can do this free of initial guess. So what we can do is we can use those tools from the um, orientation of image pairs and execute them um, always pairwise, so image one with image two, image two with image three, image three with image four, and so on and so forth, in order to connect this image sequence and this way come up with an initial guess. Of course, this requires that this kind of chain of, um, of relative orientations is never broken up, that I never lose track of something, which is again a strong assumption and typically violated um, in reality. So you need to typically break that down into smaller chunks and try to come up with a good initial guess because there is no closed form solution for n views. I only can break it down into smaller parts. Um, so if I go for this approach of saying, we, I take the projective three-point algorithm spe or spatial resectioning in order to estimate the orientation of my camera and then through triangulation estimate where the points are in the environment, um, what's the problem with this approach? Why should I not be, why can I do this or what may be suboptimal over here? And there are a couple of reasons why this can be a challenging situation. I said already we may end up in situations where I lose track because not every, in every pair of subsequent images I can actually find corresponding points. Maybe I have a strong motion blur somewhere or a strong rotation, um, which can lead to the fact that I'm not finding corresponding points for a certain amount of time. Um, there are even singular configurations in this reconstruction task, for example, for the projective three-point algorithm, if you remember that, and this would not lead you to an appropriate solution. So um, not everything is actually perfect in here. And um, this is a way to go, and we can use this typically as initial guess, but it's not guaranteed to work out um, very well. Or typically it works well, but it's, there's no guarantee that this actually works well. Again, um, some of the critical issues that I just mentioned are shown over here. The other thing is also, of course, if I have outliers in my um, pairwise data association, I will get a wrong transformation at some point in time, and then my initial guess will also not be great. Um, so dealing with outliers or gross errors is a critical factor in here in order to come up with a good initial guess. Um, so computing initial guess and dealing with outliers is a task which is actually coupled with each other. And it's also the next thing I want to discuss, how do we actually deal with outliers that we have? Um, before we answer this question, we first should answer the question, what is actually the reason for our outliers? What are things which can go wrong? There are typically two things that can go wrong. One is we can find the wrong correspondences. And the other thing, we have wrong point measurements, so mistakes in the measurement process. But it turns out that actually making the wrong data cessation, so the first part, is actually the, the real problem in reality. It's not how precisely can can actually perform a pixel measurement, for example. It's more that I compute features, point features in my image, and I mix up two point features because, for example, I'm picturing object which is self-similar, and it's very hard to say, is this this point here on the right or this point on the left? Or um, I have multiple objects which look the same in the same scene. It's very hard to make that data association. And this will lead to wrong correspondences, wrong data associations, and the question is, how can we appropriately take that into account and address this? So. Um, there are different ways how I can tackle this. The first thing is if I have multiple observations of a point and I can make certain assumptions, I may be able to identify that within a set of observations there is an outlier. And this brings me to the point by saying kind of how many observations of a point do I actually need in order to deal with outliers, at least detect outliers, or maybe even identify which point is wrong. And for that, we need to get an idea on how many observations of a point do we actually need in order to say something about it. So consider what happens if you see a point only once in one single image. That means we only know, even if you would perfectly know the location of the camera, we only know that the point lies on some ray, on the ray that is projected into that pixel. So that every pixel corresponds to a direction vector and I know the point lies on that direction vector, but I have no idea how far it is away. So I cannot even fully um, determine the position of that point. 
So what happens if I see a point from two distinct locations? If I see the point from two distinct locations, I typically get an intersection of the two rays, and through this intersection, I can actually nail down the point. I get the 3D coordinate of the point in the environment. Um, so with two observations, I cannot tell anything about an outlier. I just can say, I can just estimate one coordinate and have no idea if it's right or wrong. Um, I just assume it's correct, there's no outlier involved, so I can estimate the three location of a point. Okay, so what happens if I have three observations of the same point? What I can do is, I can, now I'm able to actually detect that there may be an outlier involved in this. How can I do this? I have three images and I always take pairs of images. So image one and two, image two and three, and image one and three. And then I'm performing this triangulation in all three points. And if uh, this is an outlier free observation, then all the intersection points should be more or less at the same location. Um, if, I ha if they don't end up at the same location, they are spread over the place, I say, okay, one of those observations was wrong, but I typically cannot tell you which one. I just say one of the three is wrong, but I have no idea which one. Um, if I then have four observations of a point, I can um, repeat the same process and break it actually further down, and then I'm actually able to say, okay, I have an outlier. If I have one outlier in here, I can actually tell you which observation contains the outlier. Um, so the more points I have, the more I can say about the outliers. And as the rule of thumb, you, you can say you should have between five and six different observations of every point in order to get a high quality estimate. So make sure you see every point in the world from multiple positions in order to get a good three reconstruction of that point. So this is kind of one thing that you want to do. The next thing what we're typically doing is um, we are typically not solving the whole bundle adjustment um, problem as once. What we're doing, we're breaking this down into small blocks. Let's say blocks of three to six, so typically more on the order of six images. And then we solve a kind of a small problem within this, within this six images itself and look for um, statistical errors in this small set of images. And if we find um, through a statistical test that a point may not be a good point, we are going to eliminate that point and removing it from our observations uh, in order to avoid taking a wrong data association into account. It's typically totally fine to ignore a few observations, ignore a few points, if I can make sure that I'm then in an outlier-free situation. So what I am um, also can do um, is that I'm only considering features that I can actually track over um, a set of these three to six subsequent images. So especially if I'm not taking random image collections into account, if I, for example, have a trajectory because of a vehicle driving through the environment observing the scene, I can exploit this sequential nature in which the data has been um, obtained in order to get a better estimate. And then I can, for example, say only if I can actually track a feature over multiple frames and get similar descriptor vectors from my SIF descriptor, for example, I'm actually taking it into account. If I have larger discrepancies, it's hard to track a feature or a feature disappears and reappears, it's safer to ignore that. And the last thing which I can do, which is computationally more expensive, I can actually run a RANSEC procedure. So random sample consensus approach, which is um, a tr kind of a trial and error approach, trying to guess the right data association and then see how well this explanation is with what else the system knows. And if I use, for example, the five-point algorithm to estimate the trajectory of my camera, um, we're using five corresponding points in an image, and I combine this with the ransack based procedure, I typically get a good initial estimate and can eliminate the outliers, at least those which I can estimate from um, sequential data, um, and eliminate those outliers, and then can continue with um, a potentially outlier-free set of points. And I do this for all the blocks and then fuse those blocks. And only in the end, after eliminating um, the gross errors, I actually run my full bundle adjustment approach. So this is kind of the manual way for, or not manual, but semi-automatic way for getting rid of those outliers. Something else you should do in your optimization process is actually move towards so-called robust kernels. Um, so typically, we, in our least squares approach, we are just saying we, every, we assume everything is Gaussian or we say we can identify outliers, we eliminate those outliers and the remaining things, in the remaining part, everything is Gaussian. And um, this is good if I can really eliminate all outliers, then it's typically a valid assumption. But I cannot guarantee that, and typically some of the outliers may remain in here. So what I then can do is I can say, okay, I'm not using actually a quadratic function, I'm using a different function, and then a quadratic function, 
um, in order to reduce the effect that outliers can have on my overall solution. So one thing what I can do is I can use the so-called L1 norm. So I'm just taking the absolute value of my error for, um, as my error function or as my kernel. And so I'm not taking quadratic function into account. This means that all the outliers, or depending how far I'm away, it's only a linear effect on the error, not a quadratic effect, which is much, much um, less, or gives much less weight to the points which are further away. Um, also a very popular choice is the Huber kernel, which is basically a quadratic function close to, um, to the minimum. So kind of we're in a Gaussian world over here. And at some point in time, the Gaussian turns into a linear function. So it's a combination of a Gaussian and the absolute value of the, the L1 norm, so to say. So whenever we are close to the right solution and we are in the outlier free world, everything would, would stay in the Gaussian world and we get a solution which is very similar to the Gaussian solution. But if we have a few outliers, the effect of those outliers is only considered linearly and not quadratically. I can make it even more extreme in saying, okay, I'm taking a kind of quadratic form in here, but as soon as the outliers um, or the, the point is, the error is, is larger than a certain value, I'm actually decreasing this to more or less a constant function. So it doesn't matter if I have outliers, they only matter up to a constant degree. And if they are very far away from uh, the zero error configuration, this data point is basically ignored because the gradient that I have in here, so the Jacobian uh, on this error function is actually close to zero. So it will not impact my system anymore. But it also means the more um, you move away from your parabola, the better your initial guess must be. So with an error function or with a kernel like this, if you have a bad initial guess, the system will not even move you into the right direction because nearly all the points will be considered as outliers. So these are three examples of robust kernels. There's even a more generalized description of these robust kernels. So you can see a, a family of, of kernels over here, where this here is my quadratic function, so my Gaussian, and then I have different forms of kind of weighing down outliers the further I go in the end, the way up to the extreme case, where it doesn't matter how far I'm away, it will always give me the same weight, or will always give me the same penalty, so to say. And what we can do is we can take those robust kernels into account and integrate them into the our least square system through a weighted least squares problem. That means in the end, I'm having a weight function and I compute based on the current error configuration a weight and weigh every observation with this, with this weight function, which, which has this shape over here. And this tells me how strong I'm actually considering it. So in the Gaussian world, the weight is one, so nothing would change. And the more, the more extreme kernels I use, the more uh, the, the weight decreases, the further I'm away from the zero error configuration. And so these robust kernels can be quite easily integrated into uh, our standard least squares by just introducing an additional weight. And that's something that you typically do uh, in all uh, bundle adjustment systems. There are even different approaches that you can do that you start um, with different kernels and then vary the kernel over the iterations. Um, depending how far you're away or how, how your good your assumptions are about your initial guess or how much you know about your outlier configuration. So it's a, it can be seen as an art to set those kernels actually in the right way. But of course, it's always good. Reduce the outliers you can identify as outliers and then those which remain, you try to cover with a robust kernel. Quite often, you, if you use an automated system, you don't have to bother with that too much because they are fully automated um, solutions for bundle adjustment available that you can just use out of the box. Um, and they will take care of a lot of things like identifying features from your, uh, from your image data. Um, they trying, they're breaking this down into small blocks, try to find an initial solution, try to identify outliers, um, get rid of those outliers, and doing all those things I have talked about for you in an automated fashion. You may even be able to integrate ground control points either by providing certain special tags or features that the system can find um, autonomously, or you still need a human operator that says, okay, this is a control point over here, that's another control point over there, um, but then those system can actually take that into account. Um, those systems are typically computationally quite demanding, especially if you can't exploit certain properties that you as a designer know about your system. So if you know that you, for example, have an autonomous car driving through the environment, you know that your car has, for example, an Ackermann, it can be explained by an Ackermann steering, the movement of the car. You know that your camera um, images have been taken, let's say, with 20 or 25 frames per second, that your car has a typical speed that it can't move sidewards. All those things can be taken into account in order to constrain the problem and especially dramatically simplify your data association. 
So the majority of computational resources in those systems are spent on finding the right data associations. And if you can integrate background information that you have about your system, you may be able to do better. If you, however, don't take any constraints into account, you have a free-floating camera in the environment without any further information, those commercially available systems or open source systems do a really, really good job. It's very hard to actually reproduce those results. So a lot of engineering effort went into those um, systems. There are a couple of um, commercial software systems out there. Quite popular is uh, Photoscan and Pix4D as two examples. Um, and, but also Meshroom became extremely popular over the last years. It's an open source software, so you can have access to the source code. And the great thing with the software is that you can actually modify all parts of that system. So you can easily replace, for example, a component for finding data associations if you want to add your additional background information um, for your system into that pipeline. Um, so if you want to play around with this software, um, either just for fun or trying to use this for educational purposes, or you actually want to real, build a real system with provides you with high quality 3D reconstructions, I can actually recommend Meshroom and would be the first choice I would actually start with. So last but not least, I want to talk a bit about the quality of the results. So the key question is now I computed my model, how good is actually the information that I have? What can I say about the resulting solution? Can I provide uncertainties for the 3D points in the environment, for example? And yes, that's something I can do. So from the standard least squares formulation, um, we know that we can compute the so-called theoretical precision, which we take by taking our Jacobian transpose, the information matrix Jacobian, and multiply them with each other and invert this matrix. So it's the inverse of, our, um, of the matrix from our um, normal equation. Um, and if we multiply this with our variance factor, then we actually obtain what's called the empirical precision. And the empirical precision tells us something about the uncertainty of our parameters, so of our unknown parameters over here. The question, however, is how good is this precision? Can we actually trust this precision? How good is the result that we're actually getting in here? And um, for the case of the relative orientation of the image pair, we can actually provide some information how accurately we can determine certain parameters, the role pitch yaw, for example, or the translation vector, based on the distribution of points in the environment. So grouper points or double grouper points um, have taught us something about how accurately we can measure the relative orientation based on corresponding points. Um, for the bundle adjustment problem, that is much more complicated because it strongly de depends on the on the scene itself, on the structure of the scene, on the motion of your camera, and where this is rather easy to quantify for whatever the stereo normal case with six or 12 points in the environment, which are uniquely distributed over the space, that gets much more complicated in the real world bundle adjustment system. Therefore, it is not that easy. What we however should do, we should check our variance factor and see, does the variance factor take a value of approximately one? So if the variance factor takes a value of one, this suggests that we actually use a correct model. And um, so we need to just inspect our variance factor, compute it, and see are we actually close to one, yes or no. And the question is how far, or what does it mean close to one actually means? Does it mean exactly one? Is 0 0.99 good? Is 0 0.9999 what I need? Um, what should I do? What you can do is you can perform a statistical test in order to judge if your variance factor is close enough to one. And this um, needs to take into account the redundancy, um, so how many observations you have, how many uh, unknowns you need to estimate, but it also takes into account what is the uncertainty that you know about your uncertainty. So the uncertainty of the measurement noise, for example. So how precisely can you specify the measurement noise? Or is there some uncertainty in the measurement uncertainty that you're actually providing. And um, it turns out if you use or run a standard F-test that you're typically um, doing in order to do this, um, given that we have a very high redundancy over here, this F-test typically fails. And what you need to do is you need to take the uncertainty of your measurement uncertainty into account. So taking into account that you cannot precisely specify how accurate your sensor is, that this information also has an uncertainty. Um, associated with this. And this you can actually, you can still use the F-test um, by changing the redundancy based on the uncertainty um, that you have about your measurements. So you can encode it in this and run a statistical test and which then tells you, yes, your variance factor is close enough to one given uh, the current information that I have uh, to say you probably used the right model. And if this is the case, 
then this precision or the empirical precision actually does a pretty good job in telling, uh, giving us a realistic estimate of the uncertainty of our parameters. That means if we eliminated all, our gross, all the gross errors, we have uh, a small systematic error, our variance factor is close to one according to statistical test, that means that we actually have a good estimate about the precision of the parameters through this equation over here. So we can say something about how certain are we about the location of the point in the environment, how certain are we about the orientation parameters of our camera, and we can take that into account in an appropriate manner. So I brought you a few examples on where bundle adjustment systems are used. So this is an example um, of a robot exploring uh, catacombs, so underground structures where, for example, have no GPS information. And that was a part of the European project Rovina um, that I and a couple of colleagues have been executing um, from around 2003 to 2000, uh, 2013 to 2016, building a robot which is here equipped with the rig of seven cameras and light sources, move through the environment and estimate and gets basically at every point in time this set of seven images and basically is moving through the environment in this direction, has this ring of cameras observing the scene and then can always find correspondences first um, among neighboring images um, and also between different time steps and in this way estimate the correspondences um, and then put this into a large bundle adjustment system and perform a 3D reconstruction of the environment. So that in the end, in this underground environments, you get, uh, can reconstruct the 3D information that looks like this in an, um, in an accurate manner and come up with highly accurate 3D models of the environment, you can map texture through that, and though that these 3D models, so this is basically just the surface information that you extracted, if you overlay that with the, um, uh, with the, with the color information, you can actually map the texture onto the surface. And this was a work done in a European project with several collaborators, and um, so Luc van Gaal's team from KU Leuven are the experts on this 3D reconstruction who generated these dense textured 3D models of the environment are even able to take into account the reflectance of objects of different materials, classify these materials, and come up with really photorealistic um, reconstructions in the end. This all is done offline. That means the robot collects the data and navigates through the environment with, with other local sensors and then makes all the computations in terms of the, the bundle adjustment system offline. This takes a lot of computational resources. That's something that you typically can't do online. There's another uh, development in the robotics community which is called um, SLAM or it's called Visual SLAM problem which is very, very similar to bundle adjustment. There's an example um, of a system called OROB SLAM which is out there since a couple of years, developed at the University of Saragossa. Um, and what, you, what it does, it basically extracts features of the environment and is targeted to real-time operation estimating the trajectory of that uh, system in the environment. So you can see here a car drive um, through Karlsruhe. This is the kitty data set and you see down here the estimated trajectory of the vehicle based on the, um, on the green points that you see here uh, has been extracted from the environment. So these points that you're seeing here that provides you with this 3D information about the scene and as the system is moving through the environment the system in every image extracts new feature points, aligns those feature points. Whenever the system comes back to a known location like over here, basically the system relocalizes the previously computed map and performs a so-called loop close. That means in the end aligns those, uh, close, those points over here. You have seen this over here. where you basically make a data association between a position where you're, where you're right now and the position you have been in the past. So it's not just sequentially, it's also over larger time steps. And this kind of loop closure allows you to then reduce the uncertainty dramatically and um, come up with accurate estimates of the environment. So also loop closure will happen here very soon. Um, see the loop closure has been executed and the system then builds a consistent model of the environment, recomputes at every point in time the least squares problem or whenever something leads to substantial changes, performs a re-optimization. And this is actually something that you can do in real time. The accurate of the results is not as good as in the example that I've shown before from this underground um, mapping example, but this runs in real time and doesn't need basically a cluster to perform all the computations. So it depends on what you need um, in order to build up your map of the environment and localize and navigate in that map. Um, last but not least, I want to come back to the very traditional application in photogrammetry where you use an aerial vehicle in order to 
observe images in Nadir view or close to Nadir view, so looking downwards onto the surface and trying to estimate a map of the environment, so the 3D structure of the scene, something that is called aero triangulierung or aerial triangulation. Um, and you see those old figures over here where you see the image plane and the projection centers of the cameras and the three points, um, a small set of distinct points on the surface which originally has been identified by a human operator, if you think of the time, whatever, 60 or 70 years back. Today, of course, we do this digitally in an automated fashion. Today, those images look like this. So you fly with a UAV, you don't need a full aircraft anymore, um, over the ground with a downward-facing camera, and you extract your 3D points, rather dense, thousands of points and images, not a problem anymore today, and then are able to build a 3D reconstruction. So the question is, how do we actually build those maps? How do we fly over the scene in order to get a good model of the environment? So how should my flight path being set up that I actually get a good model of the environment? And the good thing is in aerial images, you actually can fly patterns and cover basically in stripes the environment by only looking with your camera downward. That's easier than when you do a full 3D reconstruction tasks with different viewpoints that you need to be need to take into account. So a typical sensor setup looks like this. You're basically flying over the ground in stripes, then kind of if it's an airplane, this is kind of the turning maneuver of the airplane. That's of course much easier for a UAV because you can fly in arbitrary directions and then fly back and you basically cover the environment in stripes. And you make sure that you have a substantial overlap between the images. So whatever, a 60% overlap in the flying direction and a 20% overlap in the sidewards direction is kind of the minimum that you typically do. It can even go up to 90% and 80%. Of course, the larger the overlap, um, the more images you need to take to cover the same area, but also the better your 3D reconstruction are. So depending on how accurate your 3D reconstruction should be, you need to have a larger overlap because then you see more images or more points from a larger number of images Oh, you, sorry, you see the same number of points, but from a larger number of images, so you have more observations per point, and you decrease the probability of making data cessation mistakes because there's a smaller translation between those images, so everything gets easier if you have a larger overlap. So in the end, it will actually look like this, so consider that we have, whatever, um, 49 um, points over here um, with four control points sitting here in the corners and you're basically flying over this ram, taking the first image over here, a second image over here, a third image over here. So you can actually see this overlap and you're basically flying in this stripe pattern through the environment. And this is kind of the typical pattern that one is using in order to cover an area, for example, a field as I've shown it before. And the question is where should you actually place your control points? So where should you make efforts to precisely measure control points, which is a labor-intensive and thus expensive task, in order to get the best reconstruction? And what typically happens is you should actually place those control points at the boundaries of your mapping problem. So if this is your field and you want to estimate the field, the best thing you can do is actually put your ground control points to the outside to the boundary because it, it fixes your uncertain, your, the uncertainty in here, or reduces the uncertainty and propagates this information about the control points to the inside. Um, and what you also may want to have, if you can afford it, are so-called height control points, which are those circles over here. Height control points are control points where you just know the altitude of that point. If you do a real flying mission and um, you're basically flying, for example, over a lake, um, it, this can be useful information because then you, can, you know that all those points are more or less taken the same height. So you can, maybe you're able to easily achieve a certain height control points. Because this avoids that actually your, your, your flight or the, the estimation actually warps um, or kind of rolls, artificially rolls the airplane in order to kind of compensate for some of those errors. So the, these height control points actually fix it and ensure that you have a good estimate of your surface. So what happens is you're basically you're taking your first image, which may look like this, so you see those nine points over here, and then you're basically flying over your second image, has these source point, these, sees these nine points, so that means these six points over here is an overlap that you see in both images. The third image may be over here, so there's, again, th those, uh, sorry, uh, those two are the overlap with image number two, and these points are still the overlap with the first image, and you're basically moving through the environment like this, always re-observing your, your new points that you're seeing, you're observing some of your control points, and this is taken into account and fed into the bundle adjustment approach. Um, 
So if you have only a certain number of control points that you are willing to pay for, so to say, um, then you should actually distribute your control points at the boundaries of your mapping problem. But the question is, what else can we do in order to simplify the problem and refer to the, data, to, the, to the map that we built with respect to some, let's say, official coordinate system or some map information? And for that, something that you do today is you exploit GPS information or GPS IMU information if you can afford it, even differential GPS and IMU information. That means you have a receiver where you obtain an X, Y, Z coordinate, depend on how much money you pay and uh, how much technology you put in there. This can be very accurate or also rather imprecise. Um, you typically have an inertial measurement unit, um, which helps you to um, get an estimate about the orientation of the change in the orientation. And you have your camera. And of course, you need to calibrate those three sensors with each other. But if you have that, then you get at a rather high frequency information about where the cameras have been taken. So let's say your um, GPS or your DGPS information provides you, let's say, an accuracy of five to 10 centimeters. Um, you also need to take into account that you're actually moving quite quickly with an airplane. So time synchronization even um, may be a challenging factor in here. So even in a static setting, you can be better than this, let's say 10 centimeters. Um, if you're flying very fast, um, this may change your setup uh, quite a bit. And you can see this basically as placing control points in the protection centers of your camera. So you're fixing camera locations um, in X, Y, Z through this GPS information. And you can even use a combination of GPS and IMU in order to estimate the orientation of your camera because you can, from the GPS and IMU information, estimate the trajectory of your vehicle, of your aerial vehicle or ground vehicle. And in this way, it dramatically helps you to get an estimate also for the roll pitch and your information. So having this information at hand generates your additional observation for your bundle adjustment problem, basically adding, in this case, noisy control points or noisy information about not only the points, but also the orientation information that is then taken into account. So you may ask yourself, if I have a good GPS or good DGPS available, do I need ground control points at all? Do I really need to go to the field and measure locations in the field with an additional measurement device in order to precisely um, get this coordinate and feed that into my bundle adjustment system. In reality, only a few number of control points are needed. And you especially need them, or maybe you even don't need them at all, but if you want to align the model that you do with um, official map data at a very high precision, you still need to take that into account. It also helps you to eliminate systematic errors that you may have. So having a certain number of control points um, that may be a great tool and may also help you to um, get the differences between the different coordinate systems, for example, the GPS coordinate system and the coordinate system of the map you're targeted to align your model with. So ground control points, are there still a use for that? But the number of control points you need has dramatically reduced through this technology. Control points are hard to obtain. Ground control points in reality, why is this the case? You need to go there, you need to measure that point, and you also need to flag those points that you're actually able to, or signal those points that you're actually able to find those points in your image data. And this can be done in that way that you actually send a person there, they paint the control point that you have, they precisely measure that control point um, over extended periods of time, and then you have the precise location of this point. You need to go back to your image material, you need to find those um, signal control points, mark them, and then feed them into your bundle adjustment system. So it's something that is time consuming, that is expensive because it requires manual labor and you would like, you would try to avoid this, but depending on the uh, constraints in terms of precision and also with respect to um, consistency with official map data, for example, you may still need to do that. So in the end, the error triangulation approach allows you to use um, photogrammetric tools and image data in order to estimate maps at comparably large scales because you can fly over larger areas and build relatively cheap, um, cover large areas and build maps from that. And you can actually roughly bring this down to uncertainty in X and Y location of approximately 2.5 centimeters with a typical setup. So this is a, an estimate of a, a good, um, uncertainty that you have about the location of points in the XY plane. Typically you have a higher uncertainty in the altitude, but for the XY plane, you are in the order of um, a standard deviation of 2.5 centimeters. Um, if you do this, you want to get as accurate as possible. Large overlaps are suggested. 
um, maybe even exploiting some height control points. And of course, the more you investigate, in, invest into your IMG, IMU GPS configuration, the better off you are. So you can easily spend 100,000 euros for a great IMU, which can actually reduce your, the error in your orientation, um, especially the angular parts, dramatically combine this with a high quality GPS, invest a lot of efforts into timestamping, into calibrating your system, then you can bump your accuracy further upwards. But it gets expensive, it gets labor intensive, and you need to be really able, or you really need to know what you're doing if you actually want to go substantially beyond that over here. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. This brings me to the end of the lecture today. Um, we have been talking about bundle adjustment, which is a least squares approach to the relative and absolute orientation problem for cameras considering uncertainties. So we are estimating the um, location and orientation of cameras in the environment, as well as the three locations of point in the world, taking all the uncertainties into account and come up with an as good as possible estimate. It's a statistically optimal approach, which minimizes the reprojection error. So the error of the estimated points projected into the estimated camera images and see how far they are away from the actual measured ones. And bundle adjustment is the gold standard today and a statistically optimal solution under certain assumptions that we have been making. And we discussed here what we can do in order to get initial guess, what we need to do in order to deal with outliers, um, which statements we can make about the, the obtained precision that we get, um, how to use this in different applications, um, and what is the error that we are actually minimizing. What we haven't done so far is talked about how to solve this linear system, how to exactly set that up, how does this Jacobian matrix look like, and what do we need to do in order to solve that so that we don't have to deal with these millions of dimensions in our state estimation problem. And that's something that we're going to discuss in the next lecture, where we look into the numerics of the bundle adjustment problem and which tricks we can do in order to solve that in an efficient manner. If you want to dive uh, deeper into that, there are several uh, resources that I can recommend. So the um, bundle adjustment and modern synthesis paper, although it's by now I would also say roughly 20 years old, is still a, a very good read. Um, a standard reference to the bundle adjustment problem. Also the book by Hartley and Scissorman, a multiple view geometry um, addresses not only bundle adjustment but all the geometric reconstruction tasks of camera images is worth a read and also the photogrammetric computer vision bible by Wolfgang Fürstner and Bernhard Vogel is a very good resource to go deeper to study those aspects and you can invest a lot of time into doing it right you know, to estimate all the uncertainties uh, correctly um, into integrating additional models. So there's a lot of stuff you can do in order to get the best possible maps out. As last word, the bundle adjustment problem is very similar to the visual SLAM problem. SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping, a term coined in the robotics community, um, where SLAM is a somewhat more general formulation than the bundle adjustment problem, taking different sensor modalities into account, taking different motion models into account, but overall they are more or less the same thing. So the bundle adjustment problem is basically one instance of a SLAM problem where you use the least squares approach to estimate that. You may also use other techniques to solve the SLAM problem, but if you're interested in getting the statistically optimal solution out, the SLAM problem will be nothing else than the bundle adjustment um, approach, just maybe taking different error functions into account because you may interpret um, your sensors in a different way, if you don't have a camera, if you have, or you have a camera and a laser scanner, for example, maybe combine this with some other motion models, some constraints about your vehicle. But the overall idea is very, very similar and basically points down to something very, very similar. So with this, I hope that was useful and gave you an idea on what bundle adjustment is, how to use it, how to apply it, and next time we will look into the numerics on how to solve the underlying least squares problem in an efficient manner. So thank you very much for your attention.